Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the fact that we are here this day. It's a beautiful day out again. The wind is blowing, so that means your spirit's alive because your word in both Greek and Hebrew for wind and for spirit is the exact same word. So, Father, we trust that the spirit is blowing and that somehow the spirit might blow right through me. I might say something that makes sense, but even more, that somehow your sense through the spirit makes sense to anyone who listens in this few moments. But we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. The gospel for today comes to us from Mark chapter 1. It reads like this. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. When the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come? To destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. You know, when I thought about this sermon, uh, the story I wanted to start off with is a story about a dear friend of mine. Uh, He's a true person. His name was Tom Bear. He died back in 2017. Um, And uh, Tom was an an incredible man. He he was just a dear, dear friend of mine. now, you got to understand, Tom, his profession was, he was a videographer for NBC, the network. Uh, and he was the kind of, of guy that, you know, in anything that you saw on NBC in the first and second Iraq war, in Afghanistan, in Hurricane Katrina, in the earthquake in Haiti, uh, and probably so much more, it was Tom that was filming it all. He was, he was on site in the midst of it. I mean, in the first Iraq war, I believe he was on the phone with Tom Brokaw uh, on national news. And you might remember the event, even though you probably didn't connect the names. And he was talking to Brokaw and all of a sudden a cruise missile exploded in front of his hotel. It actually blew him through a wall on the other side. And Brokaw was on the phone, you know, in the States in live TV saying our friend Tom Brokaw, our friend Tom Bear, what, you know, what happened to him? You know, is he, we got to find out if he's okay. He was okay. He came through that. Uh, In Afghanistan, he was kidnapped by the Taliban and NBC had to pay the ransom to get him out. I mean, he was a wonderful guy. (coughs) He was a a great guy, a great friend. Uh, But I'll be upfront with you. Uh, He had PTSD and a lot of addiction issues. And uh, I don't think he'd mind me telling it. I mean, he was crazy as a loon. I mean, he was just nuts. I mean, he was out there, but he was a good friend. And he was a good friend for a lot of reasons. And the reason I used him as the introduction is because, you know, I, I remember being asked before he died, about two years before, by my wife, you know, if I was to die, who would I want to have my eulogy done by? And my first response immediately, without even thinking about it, was I want Tom Bear to do it. And she looked at me like, what? Why would you want Tom Bear to do it? He's, I mean, He's got so many problems. He's nuts. You know, I mean, he's, who knows what he'd say in front of people? Who knows how he'd handle it? I mean, he's, he's got a mouth and a half. I mean, he's just crazy. Uh, and I said, I want him to do it because he'll tell the truth. He might say the good things that I've done, but he also let everybody know how nuts I am and all the things I didn't do right. And I didn't, it's not that I don't want my laundry aired, I do want my laundry aired because, you know, they're going to know me. I want them to know all of me, not just part of me. Because the only way I can have a relationship with somebody else is if all of a sudden I'm somewhat transparent with them. Otherwise, it's nothing but a transactional relationship. It's not an intimate relationship. And you always wonder in your head, if you're just in transactional relationships, is it dependent upon my behavior or is it based in them knowing and still loving me despite myself.
truth. You know, this sermon is going to be interesting, different than maybe some of the other ones I've done, because in this sermon, I don't really have an ending for you. You're going to have to figure out your own ending. I'll be going to the direction I need to hear for myself, but it might not be the direction you need. So if, you know, in the middle of this, as I always say, if you don't like what you're hearing or at the end you don't like it, delete me. I'm fine with that. The story in the gospel that we have today is a story of Jesus and his disciples early in their ministry. This is probably the first year. Being in the northern part of Israel as a whole in the area called Galilee. Nazareth was in Galilee. Capernaum was in Galilee. It was on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and here they are. They're, it's a Sabbath day, so they go into synagogue. And they go to worship. And Jesus gets up and he teaches. And it says that when he teaches, his words come across and it's seen and felt that he teaches with authority, not like the scribes. You see, the scribes taught, and they were accurate in their teaching of the Bible and stuff, or of the scriptures and stuff, but they, they taught, you know, where there was not a substance behind the words. They were just the words that were out there. But when Jesus spoke, he had the purpose behind the words that he spoke and the connectiveness of being one with the Father that actually resonated to a palpable way with people. It wasn't like you were just hearing these words and a story. It was actually you were living and feeling the story. And he knew exactly, you know, where it came from, what it was. And so he had the purpose not to manipulate anybody, but rather to convey what the Father always wanted for his people. He spoke truth. You know, not to quote Pontius Pilate right after Jesus is arrested and before he dies, but, you know, Pontius Pilate said, what is truth? And that's probably the part where either I'm going to irritate you and tick you off right now, or you'll say, wait a second, let me get start thinking on this. What is truth? Truth for me is not just putting the facts together and getting an outcome. And that's too easy. Because then you might get some things that those facts mean, but you might not have all the facts. And you might also not have any of the motive or the substance behind the facts. And when you do that, in a way, what you're doing is you're leaving out the real essence of truth because truth is the whole picture. The emotion, the motive, the words, the actions, but the whole nine yards. What's your motive for saying what you're saying? Is your intent one that you really don't want the other person to know? You want to say it so you can get what you want and you're manipulating? All of us have used facts that way, haven't we? But truth, to tell the truth, means that yes, you are honest. But it's honest in that full sense of the word of honest, that full sense of the word truth, full sense of the word of not just statistical fact or identity of fact, but rather the emotion of the fact. How did I get where I am? In the gospel we have today, here Jesus comes into Capernaum. He's there, he's teaching. He teaches like one with authority, not like the scribes. But after he's done teaching, it really comes to the place where there's a man in the synagogue, it says, that is possessed by a demon. I wonder how he got in there. You know, I mean, usually they tried to keep unclean folks out of the synagogue, but somehow, even though he, if he was demon possessed, they had to know it beforehand, somehow he got in there. And it says that when the demon possessed man sees Jesus, he says, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. You know, that in of itself just sort of sounds like, oh my God, what's going on? This must be a lot of excitement. But isn't it interesting that here he has been with his disciples and with a lot of these people. They don't know that he's the Holy One of God. They think he's maybe a prophet or 
somebody who really is, you know, someone to respect, a great teacher, but they don't know that he's the Messiah. They haven't recognized it as yet. They don't know he's the Holy One of God. And you wouldn't throw those kind of words around, you know, to just anybody. And yet the demon-possessed man somehow knows the truth of the whole things. But is it a limited truth? Is this truth half empty and yet still half full? To know God is to know the full truth, the whole truth. And to make yourself be known to him. To have intimacy with another human being means to not just share the facts about you. If you want to do that, go on a dating site. I mean, let's put it online or you'll figure out a whole bunch of facts. But will that really get you to know the person until after you have some experience with them? I think not. It will be what they want to present to you. And it might be all factual and all, you know, in a sense, honest but they're leaving parts out. But it's when you actually experience someone that you really come into truth. You see, I believe that a lot of us just want to date other people. We don't want to really be intimate with other people. We want to just date God and not really, well, know God. You know, the demon-possessed man says, I know who you are. The truth of the matter is, he might know who he was better than those disciples did. But he didn't know Jesus. He just knew about Jesus. He knew who he was, but he didn't know him. And that is where, really, to me, the truth begins to take root and really flourish. It's where all of a sudden, in the relationships that we have with not everybody, but at least with God and some other people, we don't just let them know about us or know who we are from our perspective, but where they actually know us in experience. That's how intimacy comes about. That's how things come about. And that's how truth really comes. Truth to me is, is a mystery, just like, well, like love and faith. It's not a mystery to be solved. It's a true. It's an. It's a. It's a mystery to be experienced, and and you have to live through the truth of moving and breathing with another person to get that fullness of the truth. Is your truth half empty or is it half full? You know, in Psalm eighty-five, verse ten, it says this. It says, "Mercy and truth have met each other." righteousness and peace have kissed each other. You know, I'll never forget reading that probably now about 30 years ago and reading where it says, mercy and truth have met each other. How the heck could they meet? I mean, if you really told the whole truth about me, well, to be honest with you, some of the things I've done, there wouldn't be a whole lot of mercy. There'd be a lot of judgment, but not a whole lot of mercy. And yet somehow in the midst of it, when truth and mercy meet, there's a wholeness of life that comes about. Where are you in your life? Do you, you know, try and be truthful? Or do you just share facts? Do you tell the things that you want to tell, but not all the things of yourself with people who you want to grow closer to and be intimate with? Or do you just want to keep it as a transactional relationship? What are the things in your life that, although it might not be a demon possession like this man had in the synagogue, which I do believe did happen, but I would venture to guess that all of us have our own demons that haunt us from day to day, that we've been carrying for years and years, and we don't really want anybody else to ever know. And yet it's only by letting God know them and probably walking through with another human being that you learn how to trust which also is a mystery like faith and love and truth. It's where all of a sudden when you do that and they are trustworthy with you and they show you God's trustworthiness and faith in you, not just your faith in him, that all of a sudden those demons get lifted out. My friend Tom Bear, PTSD, addiction issues, man, I could go on and on. And if you ever want to hear the story of how we met, 
That's one of the funniest stories you've ever met. And it's one that I'd probably have to use some really rough language on because of the way we met. Just give me a call. I'll be glad to do it. I hope you've listened to this thus far, but I hope also that you end the sermon today by what you're going to do to go into where you have a little bit less of a half full truth and a little bit more of a half full truth. The spiritual life that I believe Christ leads us into is where we continue to move from half empty to not just half full, but beyond half full to overflowing. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.